Hello, my name is Luis Serrano and this is a video on how to train a latent Dirichlet allocation model with Gibbs sampling. This is the second of a series of two videos. In the first video, we learned what is LDA and we took a more in-depth look into Dirichlet distributions. And in this video, we learn a very useful method for training LDA models called Gibbs sampling. The first video is recommended but is not required to understand this one. So let's do a small recap of what the problem is. The problem is that we have a collection of documents which we can think of as news articles and they have topics. Some of them are science, some of them are politics, some of them are sports, and some of them can be two things at the same time. So this one is on science and politics and this one is on sports and science. And the idea is that we want to group these articles by topic but without knowing the topic, only knowing the text on the articles. So what LDA does is it puts them in a triangle where each one of the corners is each one of the topics. And in this video, I will tell you how LDA does that using a technique called Gibbs sampling. In the previous video, we also touched on this example. This example has a collection of four documents and each document has five words on it. Furthermore, only four words are allowed. The word ball, the word planet, the word galaxy, and the word referendum. Now these articles don't make sense. They're not sentences, but that doesn't matter. We can still see topics on them. And the three topics we allow are science, politics, and sports. Now I want you to think about this for a moment. So feel free to pause the video and think, what topics would you assign to each one of these documents? And I'll tell you what I thought. Uh, the first one has the word ball three times and then the word galaxy, which could refer maybe to the LA Galaxy, the soccer team. So let's assign sports to that one. The second one has the word referendum and planet, so maybe it's politics. The third one has planet and galaxy, so maybe it's talking about science. And the fourth one's a bit more ambiguous, but it's got planet and galaxy as well, so let's say it's science. And if you thought something different, this is completely okay. But now here is the problem. We solve this problem knowing what the words mean because as humans, you know, we speak this language. But a computer doesn't speak the language. So a computer needs to solve it in a different way. When a computer sees this, it doesn't know what the words mean. So as an exercise, let's try to do the same problem in Quechua. Now, if you speak Quechua, that's awesome. But if you don't, this is how computers see things. And by the way, these are completely different words. They're not translations of the previous ones. But let's think of how would we solve the problem here. Or equivalently, how would we solve the problem of assigning topics to these documents without using the definitions of the words? So we don't know that, for example, the word planets and the word galaxy are related. We just know how many times they appear in the same document or how many times each one of them appears separately, etc. That's all the computer knows. And furthermore, since it doesn't know definitions of words, it also doesn't know the definitions of the topics. It only knows that there's something called topic one, topic two, and topic three. Now, the fact that there's three topics is something we selected previously as a hyperparameter, but we could do it with two, we could do it with four, with as many, and this is something we'd have to explore the way we normally explore hyperparameters in models. But this is out of the scope of this video. For now, we're gonna pretend that it's always three. So the way we are gonna solve this problem is we're actually gonna go deeper. We're not just going to assign one topic to one document. We're gonna actually assign a topic to each of the words. And if a word appears several times, it could be assigned with different topics. That's completely okay. So let me show you a solution that works and I will tell you how to find the solution later in the video. But let's assign the topics to the words as follows. So I've thrown topic one, two, and three in all the words. And now let me just color them the right way, blue, green, and red. So basically we have colored every single word in one of the three topic colors. And why does this solve the problem? Well, now we can look at how many times a color appears in a document and assign it that color. For example, the first article has four red words and one blue word. So we conclude that it's 80% topic three and 20% topic one. In the same fashion, the second article is 80% topic two, 20% topic one. The third article is 80% topic one, 20% topic three. And the fourth article is 
60% topic 1, 20% topic 2, and 20% topic 3. But let's look carefully at these articles. What strikes you right away? What seems like a good property that these colorings have? Well, it seems like for the most part, each article should be about one topic. So that just means that each article is mostly monochromatic. We may have an article that has two topics, if it's, for example, half sports, half science, uh, but we're not going to find one article that has 10 colors, at least strongly represented. So that's property one of the two properties we'll be chasing, that the articles are as monochromatic as possible. And so we're going to try to find colorings with this property. Now let me show you another property that should happen for a good coloring. Let's look at only one word, say the word planet. The word planet appears eight times, one of them green and all the other seven blue. Now the word referendum, it appears four times and they're all green. Now the word ball, it appears five times and they're all red. And now the word galaxy, it appears three times, one red and two blue. Does this make sense? Well, in principle, a word kind of has a topic, right? The word ball should most of the time be in sports and the word planet should most of the time be in science. So words tend to be associated with topics. So a good coloring would also have the words being mostly monochromatic. So just to summarize, here we have the articles, here we have the words, and for the words, when we look at all the colors, they should be almost monochromatic or maybe bichromatic. It could be the case that a word belongs to two topics, but again, a word's not going to belong to like 10 topics. And you may be thinking, what about a common word like the? This word would belong to all articles in principle, and so it would be sort of colored in all the colors, but this is okay. There are techniques in natural language processing such as TFIDF that will get rid of all these non-important words and leave only the most representative ones. And for the most representative ones, it does make sense that they should be as monochromatic as possible. So now we can look at both the articles and the words. And now we have a goal. The goal is that we're going to try to color these words with the colors blue, green, and red in such a way that each article is as monochromatic as possible and that each word is as monochromatic as possible. And now this is a problem that a computer can solve because it's not using the definition of the words. Now we can solve it in Quechua because all we have to do is we have to color these words in such a way that each article is almost monochromatic and each word is almost monochromatic. And if we manage to do that, even if we don't know the definitions of the words, we have solved our problem. So in the remaining part of the video, I will tell you how to solve this. In order to color our words, we're going to use Gibbs sampling. I like to imagine Gibbs sampling as organizing a room. So you want to go from a very messy room to a clean room. And how do you do it? Well, to organize a room, many times you need to imagine how the room will look at the end. You need to put it in your head and say, okay, I think I want the bed here. I think I want the TV there and the drawer there. But imagine that you've never seen the room organized before and you have no idea the general position or where things should go inside the room. You only know where things should go with respect to each other. So you don't know that the bed should go on a corner and you don't know that the desk should go on the other corner, but you do know that the computer should go on the desk and that the pillows should go on the bed. All you know is where things should go with respect to others. So you only know relations. And so that's what we're going to do with Gibbs -Gib sampling. We're going to organize the room one object at a time. Let's look at a messy room. So we have no idea where things are supposed to end up, but we're going to take one object at a time. For example, this hanger. And we're going to assume that every other object is correctly located. Now, this is obviously not true, but we're just going to do it for this hanger. So if every object is correct, where would we put this hanger? Well, maybe right by the other hanger. Okay, that's one step. We're just going to repeat this many times, always picking a random object and putting it where it should be with respect to all the other ones, assuming they are all correctly located. 
So we randomly pick this uh, computer. So the computer should go on top of the desk, even if the desk is in the wrong place, it doesn't matter. What about the TV? Well, let's put the TV in the TV table. Next object is the shirt. So where should we put the shirt? Well, the shirt should go close to the pants, but also to the hanger. So let's just put it in between the pants and the hanger. And we continue in this fashion. This, this hanger, where should we go? Well, let's say it should go on top of the shirt. And now what about this chair? Well, the chair is for the computer desk, so it should go right here. And what about this couch? Well, the couch should go in front of the TV. And then what about this hanger? Well, let's put the hanger right by the other hanger. And let's pick the pants. Well, the pants should probably go underneath this hanger. And look what we did. We ordered the room one object at a time. This may not be the perfect way to organize this room. Maybe the couch's perfect spot is in a different corner or the table, etc. But at the very least, look at what we did. We managed to organize the room without knowing where things should be in general. All we knew was where things should be with respect to each other. And that is what Gibbs sampling does. And that is what we're going to do to color our words. Let's get back to our original example. Here are our four documents that we are supposed to sort by topic. And recall that the problem boiled down to this. We're going to try to color each word with blue, green, and red in such a way that each article is as monochromatic as possible and each word is as monochromatic as possible. So the way we organized the room was we started with a messy room and then we picked one object at a time and put it in the right spot, assuming all the other ones are in the right spot. So let's do that. Our messy room is just a random coloring. So we start with putting some random colors there, blue, green, and red in every one of the words. And now we're going to make this coloring just a little better, one word at a time. So let's start by picking one word. For example, this first one over here, ball. It is colored green, but we're going to forget that it's colored green and try to find the best color for this word. Now, this is important, and I'd love you to pause the video and think about this. If you assume that all the other words are correctly colored, what color would you give to this word? And the candidates are blue for topic one, green for topic two, and red for topic three. So let me show you my rationale. First of all, let's look only at document one. It makes sense that we should give this word a color that is prevalent in document one. So let's ask the following question. How many blue words are in document one? How many green words are in document one? And how many red words are in document one? Well, let's count. There's two blue, zero green, and two red. So it makes sense to think that this word ball should probably be either blue or red. Green kind of has no hope there. But which one wins, blue or red? Well, let's try to break the tie with another thought. Let's only look at the word ball. Now, it makes sense that this word ball should be colored with the most popular color among all the other appearances of the word ball. So therefore, we ask this question. How many of the word balls are colored blue, green, or red? And the answer is, well, there are zero words ball color blue, there's one green, and there's three red. So it seems like red one here. And therefore, we're going to color that ball red. But we need to code this algorithm, so we need to be a little more technical. We can't just say the one that won in the first and won in the second one. So here's the question, should we add these scores or should we multiply them? Well, I think we should multiply them, and the reason is probability. When we think of these numbers, such as how many blue words are in document one, what we're really thinking is, what would be the probability that if we pick a random word in document one, it's blue? And when we think of, of all the appearances of a certain word, how many of them are blue, we're also thinking of a probability, the probability that that word is blue. So all these numbers are proportional to probabilities. Now, in probability, many times we multiply them when probabilities are independent. These probabilities are not independent, 
but many times in machine learning we make that assumption to make the math easier and it just happens to work so we're going to do that we're going to assume that these are probabilities that they're independent and so we're going to multiply them so the blue numbers their product is zero the green numbers the product is zero and the red numbers the product is six so therefore red wins however there's a small problem here can you see the problem well these zeros are a little too drastic. Let's look at the green zero. It says that there's no green in this document, therefore this word ball can never be colored green. But what if all the other balls are colored green among the entire collection of documents? Maybe green is the color or maybe it's blue. Maybe we should give these colors a chance anyway. Because if we restrict ourselves too much, we may not be exploring the entire space. So what do we do to explore the entire space? Any ideas? Well, here's an idea. What if we take a small number alpha and we add it to all the numbers in the top and then take a small number beta and we add it to all the numbers in the bottom. Now we don't have zeros. The product of the red numbers is still bigger than the product of the blue and the green numbers, but at least we don't have zeros. However, we haven't done much. Red still wins here when we multiply the red numbers. So how do we give blue and green a small chance? Well, we're just gonna play a probability game. What we're gonna do is we are going to, instead of selecting red, we're gonna pick a random color between blue, green, and red, where the probability of picking a color is proportional to the product of these two numbers. The way to do this geometrically is to draw segments of length 2 plus alpha 0 plus beta 0 plus alpha 1 plus beta and 2 plus alpha 3 plus beta and then put them in as the sides of a rectangle so we have a blue rectangle we have a green rectangle and we have and we're going to pick a random point in the union of the three rectangles obviously it's more likely to find one in the red rectangle than in the blue and the green but it's still possible to find it in blue and green the way I imagine this, if I were to throw a dart and the dart for sure hits one of the rectangles. So if we throw the dart, well, it hit red. It could have hit any of the others, but since red is most likely, then it hit red, so red wins. A small aside that is not necessary to follow this argument, but if you're wondering where this alpha and beta comes from, and if you're singing along with the math from the previous video, these come from the original Dirichlet distribution. And the reason is that we are picking numbers out of multinomial distributions. And the conjugate prior of a multinomial distribution is a Dirichlet distribution, where the parameters are added to the original parameters where they came from. Again, this is not necessary, but it's just a small technicality that shows that these alpha and beta actually come from a mathematical place. But we can also see them as they help us get rid of the zeros. But anyway, we have decided that the word ball gets colored red. So we color it red. And notice what this little step did. It made our article more monochromatic because before it had blue, red, and green, and now it only has blue and red. And this makes sense because you're trying to color the word with the color that prevails in that document. And it also makes the word ball more monochromatic because you're also trying to color the word ball by the most popular color among all the words balls. You could use a different color because it's a probability game, but with high probability, you're making the articles and the words more monochromatic. And this is very important. That means that with a high probability, this little step is making our coloring into a better coloring. Therefore, if we repeat this tiny step many times, if we do it for the second word, then for the third word, and we just go through the entire corpus of documents, recoloring all the words, it's uh, imaginable that we get into a better solution at the end. Not just this, but we can actually loop many times through the entire corpus. So let's imagine that we went through several loops and we got something like this. This is pretty good. Check out the words. Most of the planets are blue. Most of the referendums are green. Most of the balls are red. And most of the galaxies are blue, although there's red too. And so that's the process. That skips sampling. So we get the computer 
to run this many, many, many times. And at the end, it will return a coloring where both the articles and the words are pretty monochromatic. You can imagine that some, some colors may prevail in a document and you may have a document that is two colors or a word that is two colors. This is okay too, or maybe even three because some, to some documents may be belong to more than one topic. But as you can see, this, this pushes the things to be monochromatic and you're not gonna have a document that is 10 topics or a word that appears in 10 different topics. And that's the point of this. But now the computer returns a coloring. How do we turn this into actual topics? Well, we just look at the majority. So the first document is mostly red. It's 80% topic three and 20% topic one. The second one is mostly green. The third one is mostly blue. And the fourth one is mostly blue with a little bit of red and a little bit of green. And so that's what we're gonna classify the documents like. And furthermore, can we guess what these topics are? Well, this part is where a human comes in. Let's look at the blue words. The blue words are planet seven times and galaxy two times. So we would imagine that this topic is science or maybe astronomy or something along those lines. Now let's look at the green words. They are referendum four times and planet once. So this topic is probably politics. And when we look at the red words, they're mostly ball five times and galaxy one. So we're gonna imagine that this is about sports or football or soccer or something along those lines. Now, this is not done by the computer. This is done by the human. The computer only colors the words. The human is the one that says, I think this topic is science or sports or entertainment or politics, anything. Uh, and this looks like a trivial step, but imagine if you had thousands of documents and you managed to split them into, let's say 20 topics, and the computer returns the most popular words for each one of the topics, then you can easily identify as a human, okay, I think this topic is this, I think that topic is that. And that's the final step of latent directly allocation. Now, what we just did is enough for LDA. So if you know that, then you know how deep sampling is good for building latent directly allocation models. If you saw the previous video and you were singing along with the math, you may remember that there was, was this long formula here which gave us the probability of building a document, that's the number at the left, and the idea was to maximize this probability. That was the math happening underneath while we do LDA. And just a quick recap, we had that the first factor is picking points out of a triangle, the second one is picking points out of a tetrahedron, the third one is picking balls out of a box, and so is the fourth one, except a different box. First and third helped us find the topics, second and fourth helped us find the words, and the first two are Dirichlet distributions and the last two are multinomial distributions. Uh, if this looks gibberish, take a look at the first video where the link is in the comments, where we set the mathematical foundations of LDA. And so the question is how do these tie together? Because in the previous video, I showed you a bunch of math and a blueprint. And in this one, I just said, let's go word by word and play this very simple game. Well, it turns out that maximizing this probability is very difficult. So we can apply some integrals and things like that, but at the end of the day, what we need to look is that these Z are the topics and these W are the words. And we're just gonna look at the words. So we're gonna look at this variable and try to maximize this probability only by looking at this variable and that's exactly what we've been doing with Gibbs sampling. So that explains why we only were concerned about coloring the words. And as we played that game of tug of war, of trying to make the documents more monochromatic and the words more monochromatic, what we were really doing was maximizing this probability. And that concludes our series of two videos. In the first one, we saw what is LDA. We took a careful look at Dirichlet distributions we used a machine to build documents and realized that the settings of this machine were optimal when we have the right arrangements of documents into topics and topics with words and discovered that when we maximize the probability that we get our original documents is when we have this perfect arrangement. And in the second video, we went hands-on and worked on how to make this probability the highest by 
coloring each word in a certain way that we play a top of war game where we try to make the articles more monochromatic and the words more monochromatic in order to classify our documents into topics. And so that concludes LDA. If you like these topics, I'd like to remind you that I have a book called Grokking Machine Learning, where I explain most of the most common supervised learning algorithms in this fashion, in a very conceptual, in a very geometric, in a very practical way. Uh, we also have some Python code with several packages and also deal with many techniques that are useful to make your machine learning models better. So take a look, the link is here and it's also in the comment and with this discount code, you can get a discount if you buy the book. With not more to say for the moment, I wanna thank you for your attention throughout this series of videos uh, as usual. If you like this, please subscribe for more content. Uh, please hit like and share it among your friends, among your social media, and please add a comment. I really enjoy reading your comments. If you have questions, if you have suggestions for other videos, I, I love to read them. If you'd like to tweet at me, my handle is Louis Likes Math. And if you'd like to see all this material organized together, check out Serrano Academy. There are videos, there are writings, there is the book, there are some courses. So check it out. Thank you for your attention and see you in the next video.